Hi, my name is Mateo Chavez Lewis, and welcome back to Music Theater Theory. Oh, as you can see, I am no longer in my Oakville apartment. I moved back in with my parents just because we thought it was safer in light of the second wave of coronavirus hitting Ontario right now. So that's why I've been MIA from the channel for the last little while. I've been setting up this new studio. It's not quite done yet. As you can see, there will be posters across this whole wall. I have one poster up so far. This is from my friend's show last year, Boys Don't Cry. Comment if you saw Boys Don't Cry. The other reason that I haven't posted in the last two weeks is because I've been working really, really hard on finalizing the songs for my song series that I'm releasing on this channel starting next week. It's called Quarantine Songs. It's basically a bunch of songs I've written over the last seven months from the perspective of different characters dealing with the pandemic. I started writing this series for myself to cope with the feelings of anxiety and stress that I was having and to fight against all the negativity I was seeing in the news and on social media. Um, these songs have brought me a lot of hope and comfort the last seven months and I'm really excited to share them because I hope they will be able to bring you some hope and comfort as well. So stay tuned, stay subscribed every Wednesday. Starting this coming Wednesday, you'll get a new song performed by some incredible, incredible, incredible performers being released right here on this channel. And we're also back to our regular programming of music theater theory videos every Sunday. So today, in light of the recent Tony nominations, I wanted to analyze a song from a Tony Award nominated musical. That left me with very few options. <laughs> exactly one musical opened on Broadway this season with an entirely original score, and that was Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief. It received zero Tony nominations. Of the Tony nominated musicals this season, all three of them are jukebox musicals, which means they use pop songs or, or previously well-known songs to tell a new story, or in some cases to retell the story of the person who popularized these songs in the first place, like in the context of the Tina Turner musical. Today, I'm going to be analyzing a song from Jagged Little Pill because I think Alanis Morissette is maybe the best songwriter of all time. Possibly. There's a lot of competition for that title. Joni Mitchell's up there, obviously Stephen Sondheim, but Alanis Morissette is so, so special. And so I'm going to take one of my favorite songs of hers. It's one of her simpler songs, actually, but there's a lot to unpack. And that song is Head Over Feet. So I'm going, to, I'm going to specifically be playing and analyzing it in the context of a pop song, not exactly in the context of the Jagged Little Pill musical. I'm going to be analyzing it as it appears on the Jagged Little Pill album, sung by Alanis, released in the 90s, because I like that album. And I think it does a great job of storytelling outside of the context of a musical, which is what makes those songs so, so effective when they're applied to the musical with a plot and a storyline and new characters in Jagged Little Pill. Head Over Feet is one of the best love songs ever written, I think, because it's incredibly simple when you break it down. It uses chord progressions that are super, super overused. It only has two short sections, basically, and then they repeat over and over, but somehow it achieves this feeling that is kind of how being in love feels it's a very specific version of being in love, but I don't know, the specificity of it makes it so, so beautiful to me. So there are two sections. There's the verse and the chorus, and they are completely different. The verse, first of all, is in C major, and the chorus just jumps to D major out of nowhere. Each verse is three lines. Most pop songs, you know, most songs have verses that are four lines, two pairs of two, but this song plays with that convention in a very intentional way, mind you. So it starts off with I had no choice but to hear you. That's line one. You stated your case time and again. That's line two. I thought about it. That's line three. The end. We're moving on. So this blows my mind. It blows my mind. When we think about a melody, we often think about the question and the answer. We have, that's a question, and then, that's one answer. And then it repeats, and in the other verses, it maybe has a different answer. And then the question again, 
and then no answer. And it's so puzzling to me, why would Alanis Morissette write this song that doesn't have... Actually, I'm going to look up if she actually wrote it. Oh, she wrote it with Glenn Ballard. Oh, I love Glenn Ballard. <laughs> so why would Alanis Morissette and Glenn Ballard, who she wrote this song with, why would they end the verse there, where nobody expects the verse to end? The first time you're hearing this song, you expect that third question to be answered, just like the first two were, but it's not. And so what that does to your mind is that it kind of unsettles you a little bit, but it's got such a soft melody to it, and it's using a very familiar chord progression as well. If you've watched my video on Safer from First Date, you'll recognize this chord progression. It's also the axis of awesome four chords. So I'll put a link to both those videos in the description. We know this chord progression. The melody is very light and very floaty. So we feel very comfortable. We feel very at ease. We feel like we're bathing in warm water. And she keeps asking these questions and responding to herself musically, of course. It repeats, and then it repeats again. But then there's this, instead of having a second half of the melody, there's this space. At the end of that third line there, you expect her to keep singing. You expect her to go on with the melody that has been introduced in the previous two lines. You expect some sort of, some variation on, and then something else, something like that. That's what your ear is expecting. But instead you just get, and you're left floating in space. It's like a breath. I thought about it. It gives you time to think about it, and it gives you time to feel. It gives a time for these very, very poetic lyrics to sink in. And it also disrupts your pattern enough so that your brain doesn't go into a trance and it keeps listening specifically to every single word, which is very important because the lyrics are very specific images and they're mundane images, they're everyday images, one might say, but there's something so warm and comforting about the images that she chooses to put in that make you feel like you're kind of wrapped up in this person's hug who loves you. You treat me like I'm a princess I'm not used to like that ask how my day was so then we get this change into the chorus and the chorus is in D major so we've been in C major for the verses and now we're in D major there's something so special about this key change I am a person who believes that the way that music influences the listener is by subverting their expectation so if your ear expects a melody to go one place and it goes higher than that, or, or it goes to a lighter or a brighter place than that. We feel that lightness, we feel that brightness right here in our hearts. Or if it goes to a darker or a scarier or a more minor place than we are expecting it to go, we feel that heaviness as well. We feel that in our bones, we can't control it. It's, it's an animalistic, it's a visceral response. And so, a good songwriter or a good composer will kind of set up an expectation and then change it on you to give you that feeling. It also, it doesn't have to be pitch either. They could change a uh, rhythm. If you're expecting the notes to land on the beat and then all of a sudden <gasps> there's a breath and then it lands. We feel that breath, we feel that space, we feel that anticipation building on a very, very visceral level. So what this song does is we expect to just keep going on in C major. We start the verses in C major, and what our ear is subconsciously expecting to hear is a continuation on in C major. You ask how my day was, you've already won me over, in spite of me. That's pretty. We stayed in C major, it was really pretty. But the brilliant thing that I can't believe Alanis Morissette and Glenn Ballard came up with is this jump to D major because it's sudden, it's instant, there's no lead up to it, there's no chord to get you there. It pops out of the ether and suddenly we're in D major and our ear isn't expecting it. So we feel that that sudden jump up into D major, it, it, it just 
it takes our whole spirit with it when it goes there. We're here, we feel comfortable, and it just lifts us up, and it makes us feel like we're floating. There's nothing we can do. You ask how my day was. You've already won me over. Feel that? In spite of me, don't be alarmed if I fall head over feet. So that's also so exciting because of the exact same concept flipped in reverse. When we jumped from C major to D major, our ear expected to stay in C major, but we went up and we felt that floating. But now we've set up this chord progression, which is also a very standard chord progression, and this is the chord progression used in the chorus. That's the heart and soul chord progression. Heart and soul, I fell in love with you. Heart and soul, I fell in love with you, baby. That's that chord progression. And so we set that up in the beginning of the chorus. You've already won me over in spite of me. So don't be alarmed if I fall. So we're expecting this again, but we get Where does that come from? Who knows? It comes from the parallel minor, but it gives us this feeling. Don't be alarmed if I fall head over feet. It's not always pleasant to fall head over feet. It's sometimes scary and a little bit angry and borrows from the minor key. That flat six chord, that's not a chord from D major. That's a chord from D minor, but it goes to right back. to this very wholesome D major chord progression. It's just that one chord is out of place. And because it subverts our expectation, we feel it in our gut. We feel that drop. That moment you realize you're in love with someone and it's just like, boom, and the bottom drops out and you just, you're in love and there's nothing you can do. The other thing is I think good songwriters, really, really good songwriters will often use common expressions and change them a little bit to make them unique to the individual song. So notice that she doesn't say head over heels. She says head over feet, which is basically the same thing, but it just provides us a fresh perspective on what is otherwise an expression that is used so frequently. It no longer evokes a vibrant image. You can also find this in like Sarah Bareilles, Instead of who died and left you king of everything, she just says, who made you king of everything? She doesn't say the first part of that well-known expression. And it's the same thing here. By taking an expression we're familiar with, we are able to easily identify it right away. But by tweaking the expression a little bit, it surprises us enough that our brains don't go into autopilot and go, oh yeah, head over heels, I know what that is. We hear head over feet and we actually, we actually picture the image of someone with their heads over their feet, upright, just going, and jumping off. <laughs> Head over feet, don't be surprised if I love you for all that you are. I couldn't help it, it's all your fault. So what happened there was, we come out of the D major chord progression that we know and love. Then we go to this F chord the C chord, which are both chords from D minor, but they are also, and here's the smart thing, they are also both chords from C major. It gives us the same feeling as that B flat chord did earlier on head over feet. It gives us that same feeling of borrowing from the minor key, but then we end up in C major because we go F, C. And then we go to G, which is no longer a chord from D minor. G is a chord from C major. And it's in fact the dominant of C major and it leads us right back to C major so we can start the verse again. And we get that payoff every time we go from the verse into the chorus, we get that payoff of that lift up because every verse we go right back to C major so that when we get to the chorus and we jump back to D major, we get the same lift every single time. And you know what, honestly, it never gets old. <laughs> God, I love Alanis Morissette. <laughs> Your love is thick and it swallowed me whole. You're so much braver than I gave you credit for. That's not lip service. 
And then there's no repeat of the verse. The first time we heard it, there were two verses back to back. This time there's only one. And then we go right back to, you've already won me over. And this is the exact same. You get this again. And the guitars in the original recording sound so juicy there. Yeah. And then again, the F to the C to the G, back to C to get us back to C major for the next verse. You are the bearer of unconditional things. You held your breath and the door for me. Thanks for your patience. And then we get the harmonica solo, which is also beautiful. And that's over the chords of the chorus. So. So far, our form is two verses chorus, one verse chorus, one verse harmonica solo over the chords from the chorus, then back to the verse. You're the best listener that I've ever met. You're my best friend, best friend with benefits. What took me so long? And then back to the verse again. She gives us a little present at the end here. Because this is our last time through the verse, she gifts us with one extra repeat of the last line. So for the first time, the verse has four lines. So this last verse ends up going. I've never felt this healthy before. I've never wanted something rational. I am aware now. You've already won me over. And then we go back to the D major chorus and then it repeats and fades out, etc. So as you can see, there's really only two musical sections in the whole thing, a verse in C major and then a chorus in D major and the harmonica solo maybe counts as the third section, but it's over the chords from the chorus. So it's basically a chorus with no words and no singing. And every single one of those verses is almost identical musically to every other verse. And every chorus is almost identical musically to every other chorus. It's very, very simple. If you break it down to just its bare components, it's about a 45 second long song that repeats over and over with different lyrics in the verses, but its simplicity makes it so beautiful because it's so simple and yet it's so, the, 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 the basis of it, this C major to D major jump, these borrowed chords in the D major section from the minor key to, to give you this feeling of heaviness, of, of falling in love and not just being in love and flying in love, but falling and there's nothing you can do about it. The conflict between the floaty feeling of jumping up into the D major and then falling down into this minor chord. All of that is packed into those 45 seconds and it's all so smart that we want to hear it over and over and over and over and over, and over because it's so good. It's so good. I love it. It's worth it. <laughs> I also want to talk about the lyrics a little bit because the verses don't rhyme. There's not one rhyme in the verses. And it's so much better that way because it's not exactly what you expect. And love isn't always what you expect. You don't always get to finish your thoughts. You don't always get to say exactly how you feel. You're not always able to articulate it in a clean rhymed way. You just, there are these little moments. You treat me like I'm a princess. I'm not used to liking that. That's it. I don't know. I think it's really beautiful the, 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 the mundaneness of the images she uses and the fact she doesn't rhyme it. It's just, this is our life together. I think that's really beautiful. If you like this video, don't forget to subscribe because not only will there be new music theater videos every single Sunday, but this Wednesday, Quarantine Songs premieres, which is my song series. You're gonna get to see some phenomenal performers take on some new songs that I'm really, really excited to be sharing all about this pandemic. Also, Alanis Morissette is a genius and she packs a lot of really, really smart stuff into her songs. So if there's anything that I missed, please, 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 please comment down below and let me know. I love reading through the comments on these videos and, and y'all blow my mind. Like you see things in these songs that I never in a million years could have seen. So please don't stop those comments coming. I really, really love reading them. Thank you all so much for watching. I'm Mateo Chavez Lewis and this has been Music Theater Theory, oh